That's what it's about. It's about Jesus, right? It's not about us. It's about him. Now, I do need to tell our graduates, by the way, uh, after the service in the fellowship hall, we have cupcakes for you. Uh, I guess it's for everybody, but let the graduates get their cupcake first, okay? So I just want to make you aware of that. We're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 6, and we'll be looking at verses 16 through 18. Remember, we dealt with 14 and 15 when we were dealing with the petition regarding forgiveness in the Lord's Prayer. So now we go to fasting Right? Our favorite subject? Yes. Okay, Matthew 6, verses 16 through 18. Hear the word of the Lord. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received the reward. But when you fast, Anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. This is the word of the Lord. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's go to him in prayer. Oh Lord, we're grateful for your word. Every part of it. Lord, we can't skip over it. The parts that we don't like or don't do, but we have to constantly submit ourselves to what you teach us. So change us, move in us through the power of your spirit. Use your servant to speak your word, but let it be about Jesus. Let everything we do be about Jesus. Even our fasting be about Jesus. Amen. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Today, I'm going to open my sermon with a riddle. Here it is. Some of us have had to do it more than once. It is something we know is for our own good, but is very difficult to do for the length of time we have to do it. The fact that others don't have to do it while we have to do it, is sometimes very frustrating. What is it? Wow. I mean, that's what the sermon is about? (laughs) Fasting, right? Especially before surgery, and dare we say in the church, before a colonoscopy. Doesn't everybody hate that? Right? Even that, you know, it's for our good. But we don't like it. And I don't know about you, but when I got to fast for that, I'm really grumpy. Right? Some of you are not old enough to know what I'm talking about. But it is coming. All right? (laughs) So we get grumpy. So when scripture speaks of fasting, our first question is, do I really have to do it? Is it mandatory for me to do it? Why? Because usually when we talk about fasting, it brings up issues of how difficult it is to diet. Right? That's one of the reasons we don't like it. And every time I read about fasting, every time I think about fasting, every time I have fasted, I ask myself this question, do I really have to do this? And am I doing it just to look and feel spiritual? Is that why I am doing it? And my next question is, when can I get back to the chocolate and the ice cream? That's what I want to know, right? Come on now, let's be honest. We don't like this teaching very much that we're called to fast. In fact, every time I even mention the word fast, I get hungry. Right? So when Jesus speaks of Ma- in Matthew 6, 
16 through 18 about fasting, we have some questions. The questions are, is it mandatory to fast? Is it a mandatory spiritual exercise for a Christian? What value is there in fasting? And are there any dangers in fasting? So we'll talk about all those. Let's start with the first one. Is it mandatory as a Christian exercise, spiritual exercise for a Christian to fast? Here is the simple answer. No, it is not. It is not mandatory. In fact, there's only one time in scripture where actually God mandates it. And that is in the case of the day of atonement. When the high priest went into the Holy of Holies and sprinkled blood on the mercy seat for the forgiveness of the people's sins. He instituted, God instituted a fast there. Now it's interesting. In Leviticus 16, where you find it, verses 29 through 34, and Leviticus 23, 26 through 32, in the ESV, you will not see the word fasting. Here is the, the phrase you will see, afflict yourselves, afflict yourselves, which I get, which I get. When you're talking, afflict yourselves. I think that's a good translation of fasting. So, so in the New Testament, people usually point to Jesus' words, right? In Matthew 9. So turn over there with me to Matthew 9, 14 and 15. And when you find it, say amen. Some of you are quicker than others. Let's hear a hearty amen that everybody found it. Amen. All right. Here it is. Then the disciples of John came to him and saying, why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. Clearly, Jesus is saying that he is here on earth, when he was on earth, saying the bridegroom is here. It's time to rejoice, right? Because our Lord and Savior has come. But there's coming a time when he will go back to the Father. And when he does that, we are to fast. Right? That's the time that Christians will fast. Right? Even in the text that we are studying this morning, right? Jesus says, when you fast, don't look grumpy. Oh, I really don't want to do this. I don't know why I want, I, I'm doing this, right? Don't look grumpy. Don't look like you want everybody to know that you are fasting. Rather, he says, wash your face, right? Be natural. Be natural. Do not look overly joyous or overly sorrowful. Be yourself, he says. And by the way, when they did wash and I did want to make this point. The Pharisees fasted on Mondays and Thursdays. Early Christians, the Didache, written in 110 AD, Christians fasted because they didn't want to be like the hypocrites on Wednesdays and Fridays. Two days a week. They fasted. Right? So, but they washed their face. Now, we always think Jews washed their face back then just with water, which is true. They did use water, but they also used olive oil. And they would spread it, and sometimes they would use a metal thing, and they'd scrape the dirt off by using the oil on their skin. And they also used olive oil for lotion. They used it in their hair to keep insects away. And different things like that. So olive oil was really big, but part of it was used in ceremonial washings and so on. But he says, don't disfigure your face. Look natural. Be yourself. All right. So where do we get this whole fasting thing from? Well, John the Baptist's disciples fasted. Anna, the prophetess, before the temple, fasted and prayed for the coming of the Messiah. Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Not saying you got to do that. Cornelius was fasting before he had a vision to call for the apostle Peter who shared with him the gospel. 
right? Acts 10, 30 through 32. In Acts 13, 2 and 3, while the church at Antioch ministered to the Lord, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Now watch. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. And this may surprise you because I don't know if we've ever done this. But when you consecrate elders, in Acts 14, it says, when elders were appointed in every city, the apostles Barnabas and Paul went, they committed them to the Lord with prayer and fasting. And then when Paul speaks of how apostles conduct themselves as ministers of God in 2 Corinthians 6, 4, and 5. He says this, in stripes, in, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings. In fact, if you study the great Christian men and women of history, almost without an exception, every single one had fasting as part of their Christian discipline and exercise. So it may have gone out of vogue today, but that is not true of Christians in the past and what they did. So that gets us to this second question. Is fasting mandatory for a Christian? No. Is it helpful and productive for spiritual growth? Yes. How so? What is the value of fasting? So let's go through that. We're going to make it very simple. Is it mandatory? No. Is it helpful? Yes. Is it valuable? Why is it valuable? Well, here's the thing. In the Old Testament, often when fasting was done, it was around the issue of mourning and repenting of sin. We already mentioned the mandatory fast instituted by God on the Day of Atonement. Yet we see that God calls, and we read it in our meditation, the people of Judah to fast through the prophet Joel in 835 BC. Remember, yet even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. And then, of course, we heard our pastoral intern, Noah Rivers, when he was going through Jonah. Jonah 3, right? What happens? The people of Nineveh repent, but they fast as well when they are repenting of their sin. Israel fasted after the civil war with Benjamin in Judges 20, 26. After the death of Saul and Jonathan, 1 Samuel 31, 13. And as part of a national revival under the prophet Samuel, which by the way, throughout Christian history, often revivals came through fasting and prayer. Right? Under the prophet Samuel, 1 Samuel 7, 6. In other words, Hebrews saw fasting as an act of a repentant humbling of the soul. That's how they saw it. Now here is a Jeopardy question. Has our nation ever called for a national day of fasting and prayer? What? Yes. yes. By which president? Lincoln actually is only one of them. Actually, there were a number of presidents who called for a national day of fasting and prayer. And most of the modern ones, like Reagan, Bush, Roosevelt, Truman, it usually was a day of prayer. Some of them mentioned fasting. A lot of them didn't. But the earlier ones mentioned fasting and prayer. But the most notable one is by Abraham Lincoln. 
Now, the thing that a lot of people don't know, and of course, I just love giving history lessons, is that actually it was not initially instituted by Abraham Lincoln. It was by a senator, James Harlan of Iowa, who brought it up, whose daughter married Abraham Lincoln's son, Robert. And so he called for the passage as a senator, a resolution for the National Day of Prayer and Fasting. Who wrote the proclamation? Abraham Lincoln. And gave it on, uh, to the people on March the 13th, 1863. And people were to fast and pray on April 30th, 1863. Now listen to how he defines it. As a day of national humiliation, fasting and prayer. And I do hereby request all the people to abstain on that day from their ordinary secular pursuits and to unite at their several places of public worship and their respective homes in keeping the day holy to the Lord and devoted to the humble discharge of the religious duties proper to that solemn occasion. Why? Why was he calling for a fast in prayer? Here it is. We have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity, listen to this, of redeeming and preserving grace. Too proud to pray to the God that made us. Can you imagine that being done this day? Now, nah, right? It's religious. We can't be religious because it's, you know, it's freedom from religion, not freedom of religion. And it's interesting, by the way, which founding father didn't believe in God? Huh? No, Jefferson believed in God. He didn't believe Jesus was God, but he believed in God. In fact, the only one that some people think didn't believe in God is Thomas Paine, who hated all forms of religion, especially Christianity. But he did believe in God. He was a deist, although I would argue he probably wouldn't have been for a day of fasting and prayer because his God was reason, man's reason. But the thing is, we need a national day of fasting and prayer, if we've ever needed it, right? And not only that, I personally think we need a day of prayer for the American church. American Christians to humble themselves before God and say, hey, you know, are we doing what you've called us to do? I mean, especially when you consider all that he's done for us, right? So to remember who made us, to remember who saved us, to remember who commissioned us, to remember who's coming again. Fasting was not just used as a way to mourn and repent over sin and to seek forgiveness from our Father in heaven. It was also used during times of plague, bereavement over illness, defeat in battle. That's why Abraham Lincoln was concerned that the nation was being ripped apart because of its stance on slavery. Right? Arrival of sad tidings like David's child being threatened with death. Remember, he fasted. And consecrating of elders and missionaries. There was a time of prayer and fasting. Yet, prayer, yet fasting was also done to wait upon God. For what? Direction. Lord, I want to know your will in this situation, right? So you get rid of all the normal distractions in this life and see God's direction for your life at that time. Reveal to me, O oh Lord, your will. This is why biblical fasting is often linked with prayer. Because it is 
Fasting helps us to focus our prayer, right? And our attention on talking to God, right? As we saw happen with Cornelius, as we see happening with Paul when he was seeking direction, where to go next as a missionary. He fasted, he prayed, right? Fasting was not about outward piety. It wasn't supposed to be about, look at how spiritual I am. That's not what it was about. It was not a means to get healthy. Not to say, some say fasting is good for your health. I don't know. Or to subject the body because the body is bad. Food is bad. Drink is bad. Well, let me tell you something. Food and drink is good. Right? It's not about that. It's not about social protest in the Bible. It's not about that, okay? It's not about losing weight. In fact, Jesus says fasting is not about ceremony. So what do we do, you know, with Lent, right? We're supposed to fast. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. But you shouldn't do it just because it's Lent, just because it's a holiday. You should do it for spiritual reasons. You should do it because your individual soul wants to get connected with your heavenly father. That's the reason you should fast, right? Not because of the celebration of a holiday, right? You don't do it because of a religious holiday. You do it because you're led by the spirit to do it, right? Because look, fasting can be easily misused. How? Because you can replace it with faith. That somehow what you do makes you righteous, makes you become righteous. No, you're declared righteous by the work of Jesus Christ, your faith in Jesus Christ. It's not by fasting, right? Amen? Right. So which gets us to this question. Are there dangers in fasting? Answer first, yes. First of all, there can be physical dangers, right? So let's talk about that, depending on which fast you choose. So we should know something about Different types of fasts, shouldn't we, in the Bible? First of all, the normal fast that we normally think of is when you refrain from all food, whether liquid or solid, but you still have water. That's what Jesus did for 40 days and 40 nights. And again, uh, I don't think I could do it for 40 days and 40 nights, okay? So I don't think that's necessarily what we're called to. Um, when he was tempted by the devil, right? Then there is the partial fast, which is a partial restriction of diet, but not a total fast. By the way, when somebody tells you that they fasted for three weeks, you know it was a partial uh, fast. There's no way that it was a full, I don't know of anybody who's done the first normal fast of only having water for three weeks. Normally, it's a partial fast. What is that? Well, Daniel ate no meat or drank no wine and applied no lotion to his body for three weeks. Right? Daniel 10, 3. Then there is an absolute fast, which is done for a short time, which abstains from all food and water. And Esther did that for three days. Esther 4, 16. Esther 4, 16. And Paul did it after his conversion for three days. Acts 9, 9. And then the last one is a private and corporate fast. You can see those for a national emergency. So you, some do it privately, some do it. It's corporately. Uh, that was the case when the Moabites and the Ammonites were attacking Judah when Jehoshaphat was uh, king. In 2 Chronicles 21 through 4, there was a national fast. So... A good disclaimer is this, especially on the one that is with no water. Never go on a fast without talking with your physician. Okay? Because some people can't because if they're diabetic or some other reasons, they cannot do this. And so be very, very careful. Uh, and I always wanted to say that. You know, do that disclaimer. Please check with your physician. All right? So, uh, shows you that I'm concerned about that. Um, but there are spiritual dangers. And the spiritual dangers, we must remember, when uh, we see that Jesus is bringing up in fasting in the context here. What's the danger? 
religious hypocrisy. That's the danger. You're a religious hypocrite, right? Uh, If you want to grow in self-righteousness, then fast, do other acts of service so that others can see what you're doing. Then you're going to grow in self-righteousness, right? That's the danger, right? So you got to be careful of that. Just because you're seeking the applause of others. All right, now here's one thing I want to bring out, and I'm almost done, is the connection between, because we're going to talk about here in a little bit, being anxious about tomorrow. What's the cause of being anxious about tomorrow? The same cause of becoming hypocritical in our religious activities. Same thing. What is it? And by the way, the cure is the same. What is it? The cause is a focus on self rather than God. The anxious person is concerned with supplying his own needs. The hypocrite is concerned about self being seen by others. It's all self-motivated. By the way, it's also merit-motivated. It is not grace-motivated. That's where the cure comes. See, grasping God is gracious, right? The one who fasts, To be seen by others forgets that the father knows, sees, and understands what is needed and where the heart is, right? Both the anxious one and the hypocrite forgets that the father's plan for us is to change us, to transform us, to grow out of grace, not out of merit, right? We don't do things to save ourselves. We don't even do things for reward. That's not the primary reason we do it. Right? Now, some people would say, well, I'm not going to fast because that's legalistic. Well, that's the opposite error. It's not legalistic to fast if you're doing it unto the Lord. But our primary motivation is we do it out of love and gratitude. Right? Not out of religious duty or reward, which gets me to this last thing, motive. Why do we do what we do? Why do we fast? Do we do it for reward? Do we do it to be recognized by people because it's the right thing to do or because we love the Father, right? Because we're grateful for what the Father has done for us through Christ Jesus. If you're going to grow in your disciplines and your spiritual disciplines, it's got to be out of love for God. It's got to be out of devotion to God, right? And you're motivated by the fact of where you would be if Christ didn't come and save you and me right? It's his finished work that motivates us, not primarily the reward. What motivates us is that through these disciplines, we develop a greater love for the God who loves us, not just today, but forever and ever. That's what motivates us. Are you with me? Right? Get excited about it, right? Selfishness is devoid of love. Selfishness is devoid of love. There's no love in selfishness and there's no joy in selfishness. If it's all done for you or to be seen by others so that you can be lifted up, there's no love there. There's no joy there, right? Now we do these things in secret to be seen solely by the Father. Yes, he will reward, but that reward is not our primary motivator. Reward is a byproduct of being loved by the Father, huh? being saved by Jesus Christ, right? That's the motivator, huh? Now you go, well, how can you have Jesus saying, let your light shine before the world, and now he's saying, don't do things to be seen by others. The motivation is different. The first motivation is so that people praise your Father in heaven. The second one is so they praise you. That's the difference. See? So we got we to gotta see why we do it. And by the way, in the church, there should be no religious elitism, right? You know, like I am better than you because I fast more. I pray more. I serve the church more. I even give the pastor gifts. Well, that's a good thing. Uh, but you know, you get my point, you know, you, you, you can, there's no place for that because it's for the father, 
right? Now look, we have mixed motives. And sometimes you've heard me say, well look, if you're going to give your gift in your offering with grumbling, I'd rather you not give it. You've heard me say that. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't give it. That's not what I'm saying. You want to give it. Please give it, right? But what I'm saying is, right, is you should be praying that God at that moment would change your motive to be in line with loving him, right? Being gracious for him. So God can change our motives in the midst of not having a pure motive and we ask him to give us a pure motive in that moment and we still do what we're called to do. Amen? So that's the whole thing that we need to do. God change our motives when we give, when we do acts of service. Either way, we can trust in the Father who sees in secret and will reward openly. How does he reward openly? Do you ever wonder about that? You're going to get a bigger mansion in heaven, right? You're going to have more jewels. What is it going to be? What's the reward? Well done, my good and faithful servant. That's enough. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for your word and pray you would use it to minister to us about what it's all about. Whatever we do, let us do it to your glory. We do ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.